Well, if you're in Matthew 18, oh, sorry, Matthew 16, I said Matthew 16, right? Matthew 16, I want to read a passage to you real quick. It says, let's start at verse 16, verse 16, Matthew 16, 16. It's better to start at verse 16. It says, he who believes, he who trusts in and relies on the gospel, and in him whom it sets forth and is baptized, will be saved. So the Bible says, so if you receive the good news of Jesus, and if you believe it, and if you are baptized, then you'll be saved. Amen. Okay, then you will be saved from the penalty of eternal death. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And then in verse 17 it says, And these attesting or accompany signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new languages, they will pick up serpents, and even if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will get well. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And the Bible here says, verse 20, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord kept working with them and confirming the message by the attesting signs and miracles that closely accompanied it. So <clears throat> here the Bible tells us that <clears throat> after all the disciples and all of them were continually following Jesus, moving with him, um, being trained, seeing what he can do because no one has ever done this. And here Jesus walks on water, yet Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves, um, wonders, signs, and they see all these things. And I think many of them must have asked, Lord, but we also want to walk in these signs. We also want to walk in this power. How else will we be effective? Have, you, have any of you ever thought as Christians, um, how can we truly show the world that we are from God? How can we show the world, for those who do not know God, how can we prove to them that God is powerful? How can we convince them that He loves them? And, and I think many of you might have been in that position if you went on to an outreach, you've gone on an outreach, and you went to go and preach in a tent, or you went to somebody's home, or you went into a village, and you had to explain to them, first of all, that Jesus loves them, Secondly, that they have received good news, amen, that Jesus laid down his life for them. And I remember when I was younger, I was 19 years old, still in Bible school, I would always ask God, please do something today. How many of you have ever asked the Lord to do something for you? And not just for you, but for someone. And I would, I would walk up to a person, I would say, please, Lord, do something miraculous. Lord, or please, Lord, show me something about this person that nobody knows. Please, Lord, reveal something to this person. But, Lord, please just do something. And I remember once I was, I was sitting in, in a hall, and it was as if all of the people there just weren't open to receive from God. Because things didn't go as planned. That things didn't go as, as we wanted it to go. And, and, and we stopped everything in that meeting and we said, no, now we're going to split up and we're going to take four, four people and we're going to sit together in the room because the lights aren't working, the sound's not working, things aren't working. So we said, we're just going to do what we need to do today. We're going to sit four, four with people in, in small groups and then we're going to start praying for everyone. And I remember, oh man, I was in Bible school, just started Bible school. I said, oh Lord, please need to do something now because I'm not that good in sharing the gospel yet. I'm not that convincing yet. And here I'm sitting with people that's older than me and I'm sitting there saying, Lord, you need to do something, <laughs> you know? And they're staring at me, expecting me to do something, expecting me to train them or teach them of the Lord or to convince them to believe in God. And I didn't know what to do. I felt so unqualified and I just sat there and I looked at them and I greeted them and I had a bit of small talk, you know, where are you from? You know, how old are you? You know, what do you do? And because I'm, I'm just playing around with time, waiting for the Lord to do something or tell me something. 
And as I'm praying, I remember I stopped and I said, in my mind, I just said, Lord, please, I just surrendered to you. Have your will right now. And the next moment, the Lord showed me a picture of the man that I was talking to. He showed me a picture of when he was nine years old and how he was in a church for the first time and the last time. And, and he was nine years old in the church and I saw the preacher pointing at him, calling him out out of the whole congregation and how the preacher gave him a word and said that the Lord says that one day you'll be an evangelist and you will touch many people's lives and you will do great work for him. And I saw this playing off in my mind. The next moment I stopped and I said, sir, can I tell you something? And he was as hard as a rock, you know, didn't make it easy for me. And I looked at him and I said, sir, I just saw a vision that the Lord showed me that you, was, that, that you were in a church um, <clears throat> when you were nine years old. And, the Lord, and, and a man, the preacher, called you out in front of the whole church. And that was the first time and the last time you were in a church. But the Lord gave you a word that you are called to be a, an evangelist, to go and preach all over the world. And this man jumped up and started crying like a baby. And everybody was quiet in the whole hall. Nobody spoke, nobody said anything. Everybody was praying softly. And he jumped up crying, burst out in tears. And he said, who told you that? Who told you that? And everybody turned around and this, this whole scene in the building. I said, no, quiet down. So that I just saw that in a vision. That's what the Lord showed me. Because he wants to speak to you once again. He wants to remind you of what he showed you when you were nine years old. And he said, yes, I was nine years old and my heart was set ablaze for God that night when the preacher called me out. But then that day, my dad was offended and he never wanted to go back to church again. So I was never in the church afterwards. My heart was broken. And every day I would ask the Lord, when will you once again speak to me and confirm to me that you want me to be an evangelist? And he said, I gave up on that. I tried everything else. Nothing else is working out. I said, I gave up on everything, and yesterday I prayed. I said, Lord, if you are alive, even if you, if you love me, even if you're still out there, you will at least give me a message. And he said that night he saw the advertisement of the Bible school that will join in the building, get everybody in, 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 the, in the area together. And he felt, well, Lord, if you're going to speak to me, you speak to me tomorrow night. And he said, here I am sitting here, and you as a young man, called me out and said that the Lord saw, uh, saw me and spoke to me when I was nine years old in a church. Nobody knows of the story. How can you know it? And I said, well, that's how the Lord works. Amen? And, and his life was completely changed. And when his life got changed and touched that afternoon, he started sharing that message with everyone in the building. All of a sudden, when nothing was happening, in half an hour, that whole building it's touched by the Lord. People crying everywhere. Holy Spirit filled that place and people's lives were never the same again. It was so amazing to, to be part of it. And, and I can continue sharing the, the stories where there were times where I said, Lord, there's nothing that I can do right now, but, but you need to do something. And every time when I would surrender and say, Lord, please show me something or please, Lord, do something. And every time the Lord would show up and he would do it. Every time, because the Bible says, and you must understand, the Bible says that Jesus spoke to all the people. If you can read it in, in, in Luke 14, and there's so many scriptures that we can share right now. But Jesus spoke, and he said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send you my Holy Spirit. And he will be with you and within you. And in, the, in, in brackets, in the Amplified Bible, it says, he will be your helper. He will be your advocate. He will be your comforter. But the other word that's also written there is standby. He will be your standby. Who here works on the minds and when you're on standby, if they call on you, you need to go. Because you're on standby. And here the Bible says the Holy Spirit is also your standby. When you need help, he's on standby. <laughs> Amen. He's there to help you. When you feel that you've run out of words, he's there to help you. Even when we pray, the Bible says when you do not know what to pray for. 
The Holy Spirit will intercede on your behalf. Why? He's your standby. And many of us see him as our comforter, our helper, and our support, our teacher. But how many of you have ever known him or experienced him as your standby? I've been there before. I've prayed. I've, I've ran out of words. I don't even know what to pray for anymore. I don't even have the words to pray. And then it's as if there's groanings on your inside. There's something on, on, in the depth of your spirit that's just bubbling out of your heart. And you can't even speak the words, but all of a sudden you start praying in the spirit. And when you pray in the Spirit, you're not in control. The Bible says, for you do not know what you pray, but it is the Holy Spirit that is praying for you on your behalf according to the perfect will of God for your life. Isn't that amazing? So when you start praying in the Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit praying for you because He's inside of you. He knows what you need. He knows of your desires. And, and so many times where I felt, Lord, I have nothing to give. The Holy Spirit would be on standby and he would step in and all of a sudden he would do something wonderful. He would do something great. How many of you remember Kirk that was in the church a couple of months ago? They've moved. But he also gave his testimony on Facebook and so many thousands of people saw it. And he was also in one service and I've never met him before. I've never seen him before. But in the service, the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, tell him, and share the vision that I just shared with you. And I shared the vision, and his life was touched and changed. See, and, and, and that is only a gift that the Holy Spirit gives us when we depend on him. There are many various gifts that the Holy Spirit will give you. But, but, but this morning, what I want to share with you, before we start praying with everyone and for everyone, is that we have to understand that Pentecost was the day when the Holy Spirit was given to the church. The Holy Spirit was not just given to an individual. Let me say it again. It was given to the church. And when the disciples came together, because Jesus said, all of you go to the upper room and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit, or wait for the Holy Spirit to be poured out over you, because when the Holy Spirit is poured out over you, then you will receive power. Because all of them must have said, but what must we do, Jesus? And first of all, Jesus said, well, love each other the same way I loved you. By this, the, the, the world will know that I've sent you. But when John said, Jesus, are you the one who will restore the kingdom? What did Jesus say? He said, go back to John and tell John that the blind see. The deaf here. Tell John of these signs, miracles, and wonders that is taking place. I am he. I'm the one restoring the kingdom. So God wants us to walk in the kingdom. And Jesus came to establish the kingdom on this earth. But all of them could not function in the kingdom if they didn't receive power. Are you all with me? So Jesus said, in order for you to be a powerful church, in order for you to make a difference wherever you go, in order for you to overcome and not be overcome by the world, you need to receive power. And Jesus said, go and wait in the upper room. And as you wait, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So you're all of them get together, waiting knowing that Jesus will no longer be with them, but that Jesus would go to his Father in heaven. And so Jesus would tell them, it is good for you that I go away. In other translations, it says, it is to your benefit that I go away. And I think many of us would have sat there and said, I would have said, Jesus, but how can it be good for us if you go away? We need you. You showed us how to pray. You taught us how to heal the sick. You taught us how to overcome the devil. You showed us how to walk on water. When we were in the storm, you calmed down the waves and the wind. It's not good that you go away, but Jesus says, it is good for me to go away. Because when I go away, I will give you the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's not just the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of power, the Spirit of holiness, the Spirit of intercession, amen? The Spirit of comfort. It's just so much more than just a Holy Spirit that we 
have and that's with us. He's everything that we need every day. And he, the Bible says, and he will lead you in all truth. He will guide you in all truth. I don't know how it is possible to have church without the Holy Spirit. I don't know how it is possible to run your home and have a healthy family without the Holy Spirit. I don't know how you can stay married without the Holy Spirit. Are you all with me? And anything that is done without the Holy Spirit is like a radar car that you buy for your son and you put no batteries in it. That's exactly what it's like. Or you buy a fire truck for your son for his birthday, but it's got no batteries in it. It's there, but it's not powerful. It's there, but it's not functional. You can see it, but it doesn't do what it needs to do. And I think if we have churches that is religious organizations, that is just getting together, go through the motions every Sunday without the movement of the Holy Spirit, amen? Without the power of the Holy Spirit, without experiencing the Holy Spirit, uh, without seeing people being born again, without seeing blind eyes see, deaf ears hear, amen? Healing's taking place. Last Sunday, we had a man here who almost couldn't walk. At the doctor's diagnose that we can't do anything more for you. But last week he got up and his wife started jumping up and down, laughing and crying, saying he couldn't do that. He couldn't walk that way. I don't know how many of you saw that, but last Sunday he stood up and he walked. And she testified and she came back to us and said, listen, he can now do things that he couldn't do anymore. There's a new joy in him. There's a new strength in him. Healing definitely came over his body. Come on, I remember that we've prayed once in the in, in outreach in Mshluzi. We prayed for a young girl who was sitting in a wheelchair who couldn't move. And there were so many people who came for that healing service. And we started praying for everyone. And I prayed for her lastly. And she started moving her, her one foot. And her family was so happy because she was completely paralyzed. And I was just busy the week later to minister at a school. And as I was driving from the school, I saw my phone ringing. And, and I picked up the phone and I said, yes. And I heard somebody cry on the other side of the phone. And I said, who is this? And the lady said, I'm the mom of the girl that you prayed for who was in the wheelchair last, last week. And I said, yes, how are you doing? Is she getting better? And I said to her, I believe the Lord did something that day. I believe healing came over her body. And as I asked her the question, she burst out in tears. She said, Pastor Yamon, I just want to tell you that I was busy in the kitchen preparing food. And my phone was in my room and I didn't go to pick up my phone, and I just left it because I was too busy with the boiling water and the food that I was busy preparing. And she said, and my daughter was in the TV room, and the next moment I heard my phone coming closer to me as it was ringing. And she said, I, I weren't sure what happened or who it was because it was just me and my daughter in the house, but she was in the TV room in a wheelchair. And she said that the next moment she heard the sound of her phone ringing coming closer to her. And as she turned around, there her daughter was standing right next to her with the phone in her hand. said, Mom, your phone's ringing. <laughs> Until today. And we followed up. Months later, we kept on following up. And she was completely healed. Her daughter, completely normal, went through school, went through everything, completely healed. Perfect. One morning, the Lord woke me up. He said, Jamon, you need to go to a school. And I just want to share this with you, just to stir your hearts. And listen to me, there will be a girl that you need to pray for. I remember I got up that morning, I got into my car, I went to the school, I went to go and see the headmaster. He said, why don't you come and preach for the school in break time? I said, okay, please announce it. So I go to the school, he announces all the kids who want to go to church this morning, go to the hall. There's going to be a pastor, he's going to pray for you, everyone, and, and preach to you. So here I am in the hall, all the kids come in, and we play a couple of songs. I preach to them, and the next moment I said, Lord, you, you said to me that there will be a girl that I need to pray for. And he said, just make an invitation. So I stopped, I said, is there a little girl that needs a prayer, or anybody else that needs prayer? Please come to the front, I want to pray with you. So as I'm standing here, a small little girl, I think she was in grade two, came out of the big group of people, come and stood in front, 
He said, please pray for me. Little girl. I looked at her and I said, what can I pray for you? What can I pray for? And she started crying. She said, I must go in for an operation in, in four days. I said, what operation? And she said, no, the doctor has found out that I have a hole in my heart. That's why I'm so weak. That's why I'm always tired. I always faint in class. I'm always sick. I'm always in the hospitals every, every month. I said, but please pray for me. I believe Jesus can heal me. And I looked at her and I said, you know, that's the reason why I'm here today. It's the Lord said, I'm going to have to pray for a little girl. And that's you. And I looked at her and I put my hand on her and I knew the miracle already happened. You know, when, sometimes you just need to show up. Amen. <laughs> Jesus knows what he's doing. And I touched her and I said, in Jesus' name, I pray that healing will come over you and your heart. And that from today on, you are perfectly healed. No more problems. No more pain. You were healed in Jesus' name. I kept on praying for everyone else, went back home. After two days, I'm in APSA with money under my arm that I need to go and pay into the church's bank account. As I'm standing, somebody grabs me on my arm and I'm ready to do kung fu, whatever, because I felt, I thought somebody is about to steal the money that I'm about to deposit, but somebody grabs me on my arm. I'm ready to, you know, sort them out. And as I grabbed my arm back, I said, what can I help you with? And the lady fell on her knees in front of me. She started crying. I said, ma'am, what's wrong? And I picked her up and she stood up. She said, sir, are you the pastor that went to my daughter's school a couple of days ago? I said, yeah, we went to go and preach there. And I prayed for a little girl. She said, sir, that, that girl is my daughter. I said, Jess, how's she, how's she doing? She said, sir, right now before we came to the bank, we had to withdraw a lot of money because we were supposed to go in for an operation within two days. I said, yes, what happened? She said, we don't have to go for the operation anymore. <laughs> she said, that's why I'm at the bank. That the money that we should have used to pay for the, opera for the operation, we no longer have to pay for it. We're about to pay it back into our account. Because when we went for a checkup this morning for the doctors to make sure where they have to cut and what they had to do, the doctors said that they can't explain it. They don't know what happened. But the hole that was in her heart is completely filled up, completely gone. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And, and, and throughout the years that, that we have seen, signs and miracles like this. We've, we've gone to Botswana, and I can't explain to you how many healings we've seen in the schools in Middleburg, in our own church. I can keep you busy the whole day and share these awesome healings and miracles and prophetic words. I can keep on sharing that with you. But it's so amazing, even when, when my wife would pray for someone in Botswana um, who was completely blind, who couldn't see anyone, her family had to drag her everywhere. And she couldn't see. Her eyes were completely white. My wife prayed for her. Aisha prayed for her. And in the service, um, she, Aisha called out and she said, Yamon, she can see. She was blind, but now she can see. So I said, okay, let's test it. And I put my hand up. And I said, ma'am, what am I doing? And she said, you're waving at me. Her eyes still completely white, but she can see. Complete healing came over her body, and we would follow up. We would always follow up, ask, are they still doing well? Can we still pray for them? And they will say, no, she still sees perfectly well. <laughs> and so I could go on and share all of this with you. But you know what? That is what we need in our churches. That is what we need in our congregations. That is what we need in our cities is for people to see the power of God. And so here Jesus says, go to the upper room. When you go to the upper room, we, you will be clothed with power to do the will of God. See, today we focus more on the knowledge we have of God instead of the power that we receive from God. And we qualify people to be leaders in churches because of the knowledge they have and not because they are filled with the Holy Spirit. 
What's important today is for people to be filled and flooded with the Holy Spirit. When we come to church, the Holy Spirit must be in control. Amen. It's not about how good I preach or what knowledge I have or what I share, what revelation I share. Yes, there's power in that too. But what is important is that when we get together, we have to be in unity. We have to be in harmony. And whenever we are in unity, the Holy Spirit will pour out His power. Amen. And there where you have lack, you will have a breakthrough. There where you need a breakthrough, you will receive it. If you have sick, a sick you'll be healed of that sickness. Amen? I don't know of anyone, any disciple that came together in the upper room who left that building unhappy, who left that building unsatisfied. So I believe if we receive the spirit of power, then the church should be the place of power. Let me say it again. If we have received the spirit of power, then the church should be the place of power. We will never know if you buy, I'm, I'm going to keep on using that, that example, because yesterday we bought a robot for Yudrik's birthday. And I have this, this story in my mind the whole time that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it is as if you have a computer without electricity. A laptop without electricity. It is there, but it is powerless. It is useless. And we, we bought a, a robot, a nice robot for Yudrik for his birthday. And we put all the batteries in it. It didn't work. I was so upset. I was so upset. I thought, we bought the robot. I didn't buy the robot not to do anything. The robot's supposed to move around and say things and shoot things. And it should be lights and sound. And it doesn't do any of it. And Yudrik was still happy with the robot, but I weren't happy because it's not doing what it's supposed to. And when that happened yesterday, I said, I'm going to take it back. I'm, I'm taking that back. Are they going to refund it or give me one that's working? Because I'm not going to give him a broken toy for his birthday. And when, when I said it, something fell in my heart. And it's just as if the Lord just spoke to me and the Lord said, Jamon, but how do you think I feel? If I look at my church, and if I've poured out my spirit upon the church, and they are powerless. How sick people go to church and they don't get healed. Are people who need the power of the Holy Spirit and they don't get touched. Are people need to experience my presence to get through next week and they don't get it. They are told, be warm, but they don't receive a blanket. See, faith without works is powerless. It doesn't mean a thing. And yet the Bible says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And if you believe and if you're baptized, the Bible says you'll be saved. And then it says, and these signs shall follow you. Are we, are we saved? Yes, we are. Do we believe? Yes, we do. So these signs, miracles, and wonders should follow us wherever we go. There should be power wherever we go. So to make this, to sum all of this up is that, that God poured out His Spirit upon all flesh. Amen? And He will keep on pouring His Spirit upon all flesh. But one thing had to happen. The disciples had to get together as one body, as one church. See, if, if we train our children that church is optional, then one day they will grow up as if Jesus is optional. Let me say it again. If we train and teach our children that church is optional, then they will see Jesus as optional. Sometimes I need him, sometimes I don't. I believe that there is a very big role that the church needs to play in cities, in countries, the church. And when I speak of the church, I know individually I am part of the body, but when we get together, we are also one body. So there is an anointing that is upon you to do certain things, but then there is anointing when we get together. The anointing that you have is to change circumstances, pray for people, drive out demons. But if we want to change a city, a church needs to get together. Because there's an anointing on you to do certain things. But when the church gets together as one body, there is a different kind of anointing. 
See, there was an anointing on Moses. There was an anointing on Joshua to do certain things. Turn the water into fresh water. Let the axe head float, Elijah. See, see do different signs, miracles of wonders. Let water flow out of a rock. Different signs, split open the water. But when God had to overcome a nation, he would get everybody together, not just one man. Not just one man. God would get everyone together and say, now we're going to bring down Jericho. But everybody needs to show up. Joshua couldn't do it alone. He said, everybody needs to get together. And everybody, you've got a role, you've got a role. This group, you do this. That group, you do that. And every tribe, and all of them had a different role that they had to do. And he said, I can pray and walk around this, this, this Jericho's walls for days and nothing's going to happen. Because the God doesn't want to use me alone. He wants to use the, all of us to bring a breakthrough. So God said, Joshua, you can do certain things, but I need everybody to work together, everybody to be in unity. And when everybody's in unity, we're going to pray, and we're going to shout, and we're going to sing, and we're going to blow the trumpets, and then these walls of Jericho is going to come down. And you know what the Lord showed me? the last couple of weeks, is that he has given us his Holy Spirit. And when you walk in the Holy Spirit, certain things will happen. Amen? Blind eyes will see, deaf ears will hear, lives will change. And these signs, miracles, and wonders shall follow you because you believe. But I believe when a church, when we get together in unity, like they did in Acts 2 in the upper room, the Holy Spirit will be poured out. And not just a situation or a spirit, but a city will change. Amen? The strongholds of the evil one in a town will come breaking down. I just know it. And what I've experienced lately is that if, when, when the enemy feels that the hold that he has on a city is about to break, what he wants to do is break agreement between people. He wants to split people up so that they cannot get together to make a difference. It's plain and simple for me when I think about it. Because it is when the body comes together that the head takes the rightful place. It's when we as a body get together when Jesus takes his rightful place as Lord and Savior of a city, Lord and Savior of a town. That's when we see power. But if there's division and if there is not unity in the midst of us, the Holy Spirit cannot be poured out. And the Holy Spirit cannot have his way in a city or a town. Then God will first have to wait for people to be like-minded, people to be in harmony, people to be in unity. And when we are in unity and in harmony, and when we get together, then the Holy Spirit will be poured out. And then we will see revival. Then we will experience an awakening. Only when that happens. Today we have so many different opinions. Or I don't like this. I think we should do it that way. That is not my type of that not my cup of tea. I said how the big picture is that God wants us to get together. That God wants us to be in unity. God wants us to be in harmony because I know that He wants to pour out His Spirit over the whole of Middleburg. I know that he wants to pour out his spirit over the whole of Mpumalanga, the whole South Africa, the whole world. But for that to happen, we need to get together. Like the disciples got together in the upper room. We need to be in harmony. We need to be in unity for that to happen. And I've been praying of the Lord showed me that when the Lord spoke to me and said, but how do you, how do you think I feel? If my church is powerless, it's like that robot not functioning. It's like the battery is not doing what it's supposed to do. And this morning, I just once again feel that I wanted to share that. If you could just go to Psalm 133, I wanted to share that with you. Oh, you don't have to go there. I can quote it for you. Psalm 133 says, how wonderful it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Then immediately it says, it's like the oil that is poured out. Immediately. So whenever we come together, God wants to command a blessing. And lately, 
um, all, all, some of the men that's in the church, we get together half past five every Friday morning. And we started with the commanded blessing of Bishop Michael Pitts. And we watch a short clip every Friday. And then we speak about it and then we pray about it. And it's so amazing to hear what Bishop shared about the commanded blessing because it, it, it steps in to what we are sharing right now of how important it is for us to get together. How our goal should be to focus on what do we agree upon and not what do we disagree with. Because when the disciples got together, the Holy Spirit was poured out. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out over them, they received power. They received power. And when they had power, they went out and they prayed for the sick. They lay hands on them. They blew their breath on them. And then the, the others would receive the Holy Spirit and start praying in different languages just like they would. So they would blow on them and they would receive the Holy Spirit. They would touch them and they would receive healing. Even their shadows would fall on people lying on beds that couldn't stand, couldn't walk, and healing came over them, and they would stand up and walk completely healed. When they got to the gate called Beautiful, they said, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have we can give you. What did they have? The power of the Holy Spirit. And that they could give. It's sad if we can give everything else but we cannot give the power of the Holy Spirit. We need it more than ever before. We need to see that healing. We need to see the power. The Bible says, signs, miracles, and wonders shall follow those who believe. Today, my only question is, do you believe? Do you believe? Are we as a church in unity? Are we in harmony? There are so many attacks against so many churches lately. There are so many attacks against church leaders. Do you know why? Because Satan and the devil knows that if the darkness becomes more and more, that the light of Jesus will burn more and more. He knows that darkness cannot overcome light. Darkness doesn't understand light. But that's why it's so important for us to get together more than ever before. Many of you have watched Braveheart. Many of you have watched all these movies. And when the time comes where great war will break out, all the allies would get together and fight together, even if they are different, even if they don't like each other. <laughs> they will still get together. Why? For the greater good. Because they need to win the war. They are different from each other. They do things differently. But they will still unite to do what? To win the war. And I feel that there is a great battle at this moment spiritually over many of our families, many of our businesses, many of our friends, churches that we know of, church leaders that we know of. I've never experienced it in this kind of way. But all I know is that if the devil is silent, they were doing something wrong. But when he gets upset and when there's attacks and when it increases, it's because we're doing something right. Amen? And that he's scared because of what's happening. See, Jesus tried to do um, what, what, what no one else could do, was to get people together. The religious system at that time said you must do this and that, then you're okay. See, Jesus' goal was always to bring people together because wherever he went, thousands of people would get together. And that is what we call the church. I understand many people are upset with church. I, I've got my own church. Or I've got this and I don't go to church anymore. I saw statements a while ago of a man who, who asked, why are the ch ch many churches empty these days? And you should have seen the comments. I was so upset. I, I, was, I was so hurt. I actually started crying that night thinking, yo, these people are so hurt. And I understand why Jesus stood on the rock. And when he looked at everybody, Jesus started crying. And Jesus said, they are like sheep without a shepherd. There is a place for pastors today. There are a place. There's a place for prophets today. There's a place for evangelists today. There is a place for apostles today. There is a place for teachers today. And I've, um, it saddens me to see how many people talk how we don't need them. We don't need pastors. We don't need evangelists. We don't need prophets. Come on, today we need them more than ever before. More than ever before. Instead of breaking down 
pastors and leaders of churches, we should support them and help them. Say, hey, go for it. They've given their lives to do the work of the Lord. We should support them. We should support our churches. We should be committed to our churches, not just because it feels good or I like to do it. It's because of the greater good. We need to unite. We need to get together. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to be poured out over all of us, to make us powerful, to bring change. Are you all with me this morning? Come on, let's all stand together. Let's all stand together this morning. And I'm going to... I'm just going to pray, and, and, and this morning, I just want to motivate you, and, and I feel this in my heart, and I even felt, I, I, I'm not going to continue right now, but I want to share this with you, and leave it with you, and tell you how important I feel it is for all of us to know, to know that God has a plan for this church. God has a plan for each and every one of us individually, but there is a reason why He started this church. There is a reason why you are here this morning. There is a reason why God let us all come together because the Lord has a goal and the Lord has a plan. And thousands of people have been saved through this church, through this ministry. But today, I'm trusting the Lord. And I know that everybody is not here today. I know that everybody couldn't be here today. I understand. And even if they're watching over a live stream, today I just felt in my heart, I want to come and motivate you. I want to come and tell you that you are not what your situation is saying you are. That you are not your past. You are not your problem that you're facing right now. You are not the lack that you are experiencing right now. You are not what people say you are. You are who the Holy Spirit says you are. And if you don't spend time with Him, you will never know who you are. If you don't experience Him, you will never know who you are. And the Lord said that to me clearly yesterday. While I was so upset, I said, I'm going to take this robot back and they're going to give me another one. And I realized why I got so upset. I realized why I got so upset. I was, you can ask Pete. Pete was upset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a red boy. But I got upset. And as I was driving home, I thought, why did I get so upset? And the Lord spoke to me and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And to be honest with you, it, it felt as if the Holy Spirit was crying inside of my heart, saying, Yamon, do you know why? And I, I didn't even really know why, but the Holy Spirit knows all things. The Holy Spirit knows you better than you know yourself. And sometimes when you struggle to figure everything out, just speak to the Holy Spirit. He knows why you're going through what you're going through. He knows what you're facing. He knows why you don't always have all the answers. The Holy Spirit knows. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Jamon, you're so upset because of this robot. Because you know what the church should look like. And at the moment, we don't yet see it. You know what it should be like in people's lives. How they should be powerful, but you don't yet see it. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Jamon, the last couple of weeks, you had to help so many people and pray for so many people because it's as if their batteries or flat and the Holy Spirit said to me that is why you feel this way that is why you got so upset even without knowing it you know what the, what the potential should be of every church you know what it should be like in every church that people walk out healed people slain under the Holy Spirit people praying in the Holy Spirit amen people prophesying and, you know, and the Lord said to me I'm on you because you know what it should be like because church should be like Acts 2 because that is where the church actually started was in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out church without the Holy Spirit is not church it's a religious organization not doing the will of God church would be like Acts where people are drunk in the Holy Spirit praying in different languages come on you should be so flattered with the Holy Spirit people must think you're drunk 
They must mistake you for somebody being drunk. Come on, I'm going to be bold today. I'm not going to worry what people might say about this. I'm going to be bold today. Franklin, clearly, Peter got out of the building drunk. What is a drunk person like? They don't care about anything. They just love everybody. And you're Peter, love everyone drunk and with the spirit and he walked and he was just in love with everybody. Come on, just think about it for a second. He was, didn't care about the problem that happened yesterday. He was hurt because of Jesus not being there anymore. But still, the joy of the Holy Spirit gave him so much peace. And he walked out. And, it's, and the people said, oh, look at Peter. He's supposed to be a holy man, but he's drunk. Nine in the morning, it's still early to be drunk. Maybe eight o'clock, but nine in the morning, that's just... And Peter said, I'm not drunk as you suppose. But we have received the Holy Spirit. And here he walked. And he might, must, might have looked drunk. You know, but these days people will judge you in church if, you look, if you're drunk under the Holy Spirit. People will judge you if you start laughing in the Holy Spirit. Why? Would it shouldn't happen in church. That is what church should be like. Are you all with me? That is church. That is where the church started, the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out over the people. And P Peter said, I'm not drunk as you suppose. We have just experienced the most awesome, awesome thing, tongues of fire. The Holy Spirit poured about over every single one of us. And the building shook and they walked and prayed, healed. Layman would stand up, healed, blind eyes would open. The man who couldn't walk, well, we, we, we don't have anything to give you, but, but we have, we give you. We received it. We've got it. Come on, church. We have received the power of the Holy Spirit. It's time for us to start walking in it more than ever before. It's time for us to have that batteries recharged in us causing us to walk in power, amen, causing us to function as a church to do the will of God, not backing down, not stepping back, but saying, Lord Jesus, you've got a will, Lord Jesus, you've got a plan, the church is holy, the church is good, that's why I love church, Jesus created it, the Holy Spirit formed it and empowered it. And we are supposed to be in charge. We are supposed to be that body that needs to function. But the only way we can function is if Jesus is the head. And today I want to say, church, if we want to move as one person, we have to once again surrender to Jesus. We say, Jesus, we surrender to the bigger picture. I might have had opinions. I might have had ideas. But today... I don't want to be separate from the body. I want to be part of the body. And the only way I can be part of the body is if I surrender under Jesus. Are you all with me? So this morning, before we continue, I want to pray a prayer with you. And just there where you are, you can lift up your hands if you want, or you can put your hand on your heart. But I wanted to pray with you. Just pray after me. Lord Jesus, come on all of us. Lord Jesus, thank you that this morning, we surrender once again to your headship, to your authority. Lord Jesus, thank you that as we all surrender to your authority and your headship in unity and in agreement, like the disciples did in the upper room, in Acts 2, we thank you that you will pour out your Spirit over us. That you will command a blessing as we are all together this morning. In Jesus' name. Come on, right there where you are, just receive it right now. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Your Holy Spirit, come and fill and flood this place this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. 
thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, right now, just surrender. Just surrender. And just say, thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. I just want to stir your faith a little this morning before we pray for you. But about three or four years ago, we were having a service and we were praying almost the same prayer that we are praying right now today. And in the service, the Lord stopped me and he said, Jermon, there's somebody watching over the live stream that you need to pray for. And I don't know how many of you can remember that service, but I stopped the service and I said, there's a Ruan watching via live stream and um, the Lord shows me that your ankle broke. And, and I remember over the last time I said, the Lord's going to heal your ankle and take away all the pain you're experiencing. And I just did that with, in a step of faith. And a week later, um, they contacted me. And they said, Jamon, you won't believe what happened. We were at home and we switched on the TV and we went on to Cornerstone to watch the live stream on Facebook. And as we switched it on, we went and sat down. And you pointed at the camera and you said that there is a Ruan. And my husband like held onto the couch because his name is Ruan. <laughs> and he held onto the couch and he said, wow, he's going to, over the live stream? Isn't that amazing? That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I prayed and I said, there's something wrong with your ankle. You hurt your ankle. But right now, healing is going to come over your leg and the Lord's going to heal you. And he sat there and he said to his wife, um, my leg is burning. My leg is burning. Because he was in a motorcycle accident about five years ago. Hurt his leg really bad. Couldn't walk normally because of the motorcycle accident. I've, I haven't met him. Come on, over live stream. And I gave the message. And in that meeting, heat came over his leg. All the pain left his leg. He started walking better and better every single day. They actually came to the service a couple of weeks later, just to come and testify. Isn't that amazing? That's the Lord, amen? That's God over a live stream. Over a live stream. That is just proof that God is with us, amen? That is proof that God is here. And last week, me and Jock, we spoke about it. We said, why did God start this church in Middleburg? Why did God want to start Cornerstone Church in Middleburg? It's because God knew that we believe. And that's what all our t-shirt says, we believe. We believe. We believe in signs, miracles, and wonders. Amen. We will allow the Holy Spirit to move in this church. We will pray in different tongues and different languages. Amen. We will pray for the sick and they shall recover. We will lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. Amen. We will pray and we will receive the Holy Spirit. That's why we are here. That's why we as leaders of the church are giving our lives and laying it down for this purpose. But we need to get together as a church to have the corporate anointing to bring difference in our town. That's why we need to agree. That's why we need to show up. That's why we need to be committed. That's why we need to step in. And I want to thank everyone that's here this morning, all those that's part of the ministry. We are on our way to do something great for the Lord. Amen. And we are all part of it. So this morning, that we're still going to baptize people after the service. But this morning, we're going to close the meeting. And I'm going to ask Pete and Ian and Mary and, and all those to pray with me this morning. And if there's any other leaders here, area leaders, who would like to pray with us, I want to ask you. I'm going to anoint you with the oil. And I'm going to ask everybody, we're going to put some music on. But this morning, if you're expecting, if you need a word from God, if you need to, to experience, and if you want to feel the Holy Spirit's power, and if you just say, well, I just need to feel the anointing. We always sang that song, just one touch of the Holy Ghost. is not enough for me. How many of you know that song? We would always sing that song at church. And I just love that. But this morning, we're going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Even if I have to pray for everyone, I will do that this morning. 
But we're going to pray for you. And afterwards, we're going to baptize all those who want to get baptized. You're welcome to be part of that. You're welcome to go and drink a coffee with someone else. Jock and Carla is really doing a lot of effort to, to bless you guys. So please go and get a coffee before you go home. Support them. Support the church and ministry. But this morning, before we do that, before we pray for everyone, I want to create an opportunity for us to give this morning. So if we can just get the buckets ready this morning. We're going to put the buckets here. And, um, and we have a speed point machine at the back where you can swipe your card, where you can give via your card. And then we have the bank details on, this, on the screen, and on your screen, all those watching. We have that on. See so if you want to give um, via EFT, you're welcome to do so. At this moment, we really do need your support. And if it's in your capacity to give this morning or to bless this morning, we will really appreciate your help. We need everybody's help at this moment. Amen. So um, if you are one with us and you want to help us break through, please help us to break through into what we need to do this month. I'm trusting the Lord for us to finish the coffee shop, to do a couple of restoration work as well and maintenance. So if you want to help with that, let's give this morning. Amen. Let me pray over your seat and I'm going to bless your seat. And then I'm going to ask, come to the front. And if you need prayer, we're going to pray for you. Amen. It's all that's in the hand. Lord, I want to thank you that we are able to give this morning. Lord, I want to thank you that as we sow and as we give, that we are a part of this ministry, that we are part of this dream and part of this vision. We know that together we can bring a change in a town and in a city. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that this morning you will speak to every person's heart and that you will do a new work, that you will recharge them, Lord to be set ablaze for you and your kingdom. But I think that as we sow the seed, we bring forth a harvest for every business, every family, and every individual person. We thank you for your protection over us. We thank you for an awesome week. And we thank you, Lord, for your power. And we will walk in your power. Holy Spirit, come and lead us and come and guide us in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.